I, uh, I heard a story a couple years ago about an older couple named Morris and Esther. And Morris and Esther would go to the state fair every single year. And at the state fair, uh, they had all these different attractions. And one of the attractions was you could pay to like take a plane ride. And every year, Morris would say, I want to do that. I want to take that plane ride so bad. And then Esther would say, I know, dear, but it's $50. And $50 is $50. Year after year after year, this is how it would go. And finally, uh, one year, they were in their 90s, and Morris said, you know what? I don't care anymore. If I don't go this year, I might not ever get a chance to go. And his wife said, I know, dear, but it's, it's $50. And $50 is $50. Well, the pilot of the plane overheard their argument, so he turned to them and said, tell you what, uh, I'll take you both up for free as long as you don't make a single sound while you're up there. So for the entire flight, if you don't make a single sound, say a single word, the flight is free. But if I hear a single peep out of either of you, uh, it's $50. So they thought, all right, well, that's too good a deal to pass up, right? So they loaded in and, they, and the guy just went bananas, right? He like shot up and he was doing barrel rolls and he was other aviation terms I don't know. And he's just going, he's going nuts. And they were just silent the whole time. Couldn't believe it. So he lands the plane and he turns to congratulate the couple and notices that only Morris is sitting there. And he goes, what happened, man? Where is your wife? Why didn't you say anything? And Morris said, I was going to say something a while back there when she slipped loose. But uh, then I thought, $50 is $50. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can tell uh, some of you loved that joke and others of you uh, hated it. <laughs> I wanted to start with something lighthearted, though, because today we're talking about something a little heavy, and we're going to talk about money. Did you notice all the fun got sucked out of the room, like, <laughs> in an instant? Yeah. Um, and there's some things that I've learned about money in particular this week that I, I didn't know. Maybe you knew this already, but, like, for example, um, who can tell me what this is? It's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a penny, right. I learned this week that, according to the U.S. Mint, it cost 1.7 cents to make each penny. Do you know that? It costs more to make it than it's actually worth. Or how about, how about this? Some of you have maybe even never seen one of these. Anyone know what this is? It's not an NFT. Nope, it's a, uh, it's a $1 bill. And we, we call this uh, paper money, but did you know that this $1 bill is actually made of 75% uh, cotton and 25% linen? It's, it's not actually even made from paper at all. I, I had no idea. In fact, on all of our U.S. currency, we have the phrase stamped, uh, in God we trust. But did you know that that's not always been the case either? When our country was established, the founders chose e pluribus unum as our national motto, which means from many, one. It actually wasn't until 1956 that in God we trust became our national motto and including it on our money became a, a requirement. Now you might be wondering, why is that? I think the why is so fascinating. It was done in response to the feared secularizing ideology of communism. Simply put, we wanted to set ourselves apart from the communists by printing the word God on our money. Here's the irony for me. Here's the ironic part. We print in God we trust on the very thing many of us place our trust in instead. Myself included, by the way. So today we're going to go there, if it's all right. We're going we're to talk about money. And you, you might be here thinking, okay, it's a church though. Like, shouldn't we be talking about like spiritual things? Here's some more about money that I didn't know. Did you know that in the pages of scripture, Genesis, Revelation, there are more than 2,000 passages about money? about our wealth, about our possessions. In fact, Jesus spends almost a quarter of his earthly ministry talking about what we do with our stuff. 16 of his 38 parables deals with money. There is more in the New Testament about money than heaven and hell combined. And five times more verses deal with money and possessions than prayer. So if you're here today and you're wondering, well, why aren't we talking about spiritual things? I would argue that Jesus seems to believe that what we do with money, our resources, our wealth is a deeply spiritual thing. Now, if you're just joining us, we're in week eight of a, a series in James. James is the half-brother of Jesus, and he's writing this letter to the scattered churches who have been fleeing persecution to encourage them, but also to challenge them. And uh, I learned this week that James had a nickname 
One of James's nicknames as a leader in the early church was James the Just. If you've been with us for any length of time in this series, you know that makes sense because he seems to have this real like justice bent about how things are supposed to be. So uh, we're going to be kind of anchored in chapter five, but I want to read the verses that kind of lead up to where we'll be landing today. So we left off in verse 11 last week. Chapter four, verse 11 says this, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. A few weeks ago, we talked about like the power of the tongue. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? He's not talking about discernment, by the way. He's talking about if you are the recipient of grace, which is like the center of the gospel story, who are we to turn our noses up towards other people? He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. We call it the sin of omission, right? Sin isn't just simply like doing things, but if we know the good we're supposed to do and don't do it, James says, that's sin. Now we come to chapter five, and we've talked about this before, but like in the original language, there were no chapter and verse headings. I think sometimes that can be really helpful, but sometimes it can be distracting because it feels like a whole new chapter in the book. So what James is gonna say is connected to what he just said about how we use our tongue, about the arrogance of our lives, about sin of commission, sin of omission. And here's how chapter five begins. He says, now listen, you rich people. Okay, so who internally just like breathed a sigh of relief? Like, whew, he's not talking to me. Anyone, right? <laughs> Good, this message is for someone else. I can't wait to send it to him. Um, first off, let me just kind of paint things in a global perspective. If you made $40,000 last year, you're in the top 4% of wage earners on the planet. If you made $48,000, you are in the top 1%. If that's anywhere close to where you're at, at a global perspective, James is talking to us. In fact, a few years ago, Money Magazine did a survey and they asked this question, how much money would you need to have in liquid assets to feel like you were rich? Do you wanna know what the answer was? <laughs> the answer was $5 million. Which means for the vast majority of people like taking that survey, they're like two million, destitute, right? Like just. <laughs> barely making ends meet, right? The problem is that when we don't know we're rich, we don't act like we're rich. Maybe put another way, uh, nobody's rich, but everyone knows someone who is, <laughs> right? He's not talking to me. I, kn I know someone who's rich. Their house is X amount bigger. They're making this much more money. James is talking to us. In fact, would you just turn to a neighbor right now and say, I think he's talking to you. I think he's talking to you. Yeah, let's make it real awkward in here. Great. So James gets right to the point. Here's the rest of verse one. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> listen, I don't write the mail. I just deliver it, okay? So here, James is gonna lay out, I think, at least four warnings, both for the early church, but also I would argue four warnings for us to be mindful of today. Warning number one, don't hoard. Verse two, your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. James seems to take real seriously the idea of stockpiling, of hoarding. In fact, I, th I thought this was fascinating. Americans now have 2.3 billion square feet of self-storage space. That is about seven square feet for every single person in the US. And the vast majority of those people also have like a garage or an attic or a basement, right? We are storing all the additional stuff that we can't fit in our bigger and bigger houses. All of that stuff used to be money and all of that money used to be time. Now notice what James is saying here. He says, your wealth is rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Now this isn't like deeply profound, but like moths don't typically eat clothes we're wearing, right? 
Like the food that rots is not the food that we're eating. Like just a, a, a moment of disclosure. How many of us have like clothes in our closet right now that we haven't worn for a decade or more? Anyone? Am I the only one? That's, like I, saw, I saw a meme this week. It said, here's my closet. Uh, I have 15 shirts I hope to fit in one day and one shirt I wear every day, right? <laughs> And I, I mean this, I'm saying this to someone who is not strong in this area at all. I'm very sentimental. It's really hard for me to part with things. We've moved multiple times and each time we move, I think, now I'm really gonna purge. Now I'm gonna get rid of the stuff and I just, I, I never do. And I bring with me items like this, for example. Um, that is, <laughs> and a picture doesn't do it justice. Those are like real emerald eyes and it's like an actual bow. It's got a real like, three-dimensional vibe to it. I, w I wish I could tell you that I did not bring that with me to Tennessee. That would be a lie. It is with me right now. I wish I could tell you that this was an ugly sweater competition, but do you see anyone else wearing an ugly sweater? No. <laughs> I have a problem. Something's wrong. And I just, I hold and I cling to it. Now that obviously, that's like a, that's a silly example. But as a church, in a world of need, we need to ask, do I have an extra car while others need transportation? Do I have extra furniture while others have no bed to sleep on? Do I have extra clothes while others wear the same thing every day? Just to, again, to put it in perspective, one billion people on planet Earth live on less than $1 a day. Three billion live on less than $2 a day. We are incredibly rich. And the reason that hoarding is such a big deal, I think, for James, is that hoarding, grasping, taking is antithetical to the gospel. We read in Philippians that Jesus emptied himself out. He did not consider equality with God something to cling to, to grasp. He emptied himself out. I mean, most of us know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he, he, he gave. We're made in the image and likeness of a generous God. The gospel message is that when I could do nothing to earn, deserve, or merit God's favor or affection, he just lavished it on us in Christ Jesus. So to hoard, to stockpile, to keep from others in so many ways is antithetical to the gospel message because the center of the story is not grasping for more. It's receiving. His second warning is this, don't cheat. Verse four, look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. So in this first century context, in this agrarian society, it was very common to hire what were called day laborers. And day laborers were typically paid at the end of the day. And most day laborers were so poor that they used whatever they got at the end of the day to purchase their next meal. Like it was true paycheck to paycheck. So here you have like a, a, a wealthy landowner who's wealthy enough at least to hire people, but he's refusing to give the money that they've earned. That's a problem, James says. He's cheating them. And in the first century, there were no contracts. There were no labor unions. A boss could simply say, nah, I don't like your work. The other thing about being a day laborer is they often had to like travel to where the work was. So if like the boss just like held out long enough, the person would eventually have to move on. But I don't think this verse simply applies to, uh, to those of us who like employ people. I think it also applies to those of us who perhaps in some way, shape or form, we charge too much. We sell a used car with problems, but we don't tell the person buying it. Maybe for us, it's something seemingly innocent enough, like I just waste time at work. Maybe it's even something as simple as being stingy. Now I do wanna say, there's a big difference between being frugal and being stingy, right? As like a lifelong frugal penny pincher to a fault. Here's, here's how I would define them. Frugal is using a coupon at a restaurant. Way to go, good for you, high five. Stingy is tipping the server on that discounted meal. And this, listen, I realize this is like an unpopular evangelism strategy, but here's my secret hope for us as a church. I hope that we become known as the most generous people in this city. Like I know a lot of waiters and waitresses, servers who hate working on Sundays, why? That's when all the Christians eat and have notoriously, unfortunately, been very, very stingy. What if we became known as the most extravagantly generous people in our cities? I think that would send a shockwave to our communities. Not because we're so great or we figure something out. We're like, man, God has been so generous to me. How can I not then in turn be generous to you? 
It might be wise for us to reflect on the golden rule to ask ourselves, do I treat others the way I would like to be treated or do I benefit at the cost of other people? He's warning us not to value our money more than people. And I heard a pastor years ago say it this way. I think it was so succinct. He said, we will either love people and use things or love things and use people. We will either love people and we will use things, resources, whatever we have to like better love them or we will love things so much that we will use people to get more and more of them. Warning number three, he says, don't be selfish. Verse five, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Okay, so the, these are like intense words, right? And I'm not a farmer. Some of you are, but like, what do you typically do with a hog that you're getting ready for the slaughter? Just keep feeding them, right? And I imagine like the other little piggies in the pen are like, man, that guy's living the dream, right? <laughs> Just eating and eating and eating, not realizing where it's leading him to. James is saying, you are fattening yourself up and it's actually, it's leading to your destruction. James accuses the rich of getting fat while the poor go hungry. And the truth is, and I found this, you know, in almost 20 years of being a pastor, is that the more money you make, the easier it is to be selfish. Here are a few stats. If you have a median household income of $50,000, on average, you'll give about 6% of it away to churches or charities or whatever. Next bracket, 200,000, on average, you give away 4%. In fact, in 2011, the top 20% of wealthy people in the United States gave just 1.3% of their wealth to charity. M money, not always, but money does tend to do this. In fact, at one point in history, the wealthiest man in the country, maybe the world, was John D. Rockefeller. And there's this like haunting interview where the reporter asks him, John, how much is enough? Right, as if to say like, you, listen, you're, you're king. Like, how much is enough? And his response was bone chilling. His response to the question, how much is enough, was this, just a little more. Does that resonate with anyone? That you told yourself, like, once I'm making this dollar amount, like, then I'll be content, then I'll be happy. And maybe you felt content for, what, like half a second? Maybe a week, maybe a month, but then the goalpost just got moved again. Maybe it's square footage, maybe it's a platform, maybe it's a position, whatever it is. I'm not saying it's bad to have aspirations, but like money has that way of kind of creeping into our psyche just a little more. Oh, if you could just make just a little more, we can become obsessed with just a little more. However, I think being generous can have the opposite effect. There is a, uh, a famous psychiatrist named Carl Menninger, and he said this, money giving is a very good criterion in a way of a person's mental health. Generous people are rarely mentally ill people. Not a Christ follower, by the way. He's saying there's actual like physiological, neurological correspondence to our ability to loosen our grip on our stuff and to give it away. In fact, there's this brilliant article, the US News and World Report explains this idea in this article. The article was called, What Generosity Does to Your Brain. Listen to this excerpt. It says, the feel good effects of giving begin in the brain. It's called a giver's glow. It's triggered by brain chemistry, which recognizes rewarding stimuli. Philanthropy doles out several different happiness chemicals, including dopamine, endorphins that give people a sense of euphoria, and oxytocin, which is associated with tranquility, serenity, or inner peace. This pleasure and reward system, at its most basic level, is tied to the joy we receive from eating, sex, and social interactions. Some of you just woke up, right? Okay. Viewing the brain with MRI technology during moments of generosity or selfless behavior has led scientists to uncover that even the thought of giving can engage this ancient response. This explains why the brain responds to generosity in a similar way as it does to behaviors necessary for life. Please don't miss this. Again, not a Christian article at all, but asserting there's something in our DNA. We are hard wired for generosity. Did you catch the, the piece at the end? Even thinking about being generous? How twisted is that? We could all just spend the next 30 seconds thinking about being generous and our bodies would reap some kind of neurological benefit. The reason that's so profound is it's not that God is asking us to do something because it's like, that's what good Christians do. He's saying you're made in the image and likeness of a generous God. Like it or not, it's in your DNA to be a person of generosity. And then his last warning, warning number four, don't buy into the system. All my punk rockers are like, yeah, get them. Don't buy into the system. 
Verse 6. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. So I think there's two things going on here. On one hand, I think James is talking about people who are like literally paying off judges. But I think he's also addressing those who oppressed people systematically. In James's day, when he's referring to the rich, he's referring to like the religious elite who indulged in the proceeds of the sacrifices brought to the temple by your average everyday Jews. But their posture towards God was pragmatic at best. And they worked hard at maintaining the status quo so they remained in power. And James the just is saying that system is anything but just. Today, we are surrounded by systems that are anything but just. Systems that deliver our food, make our clothes, take away our garbage. And most of us, myself included, rarely take the time to investigate how fair and just those systems actually are. In fact, years ago, I found this website called slaveryfootprint.org. I highly recommend you at least check it out. It's devoted to educating people about their consumer power to end slavery around the world. I took the test and I did not score well. You just answer some questions about your spending habits and the products you use. It is a sobering reality how often we are complicit in systems that are not just, that do not further human flourishing and dignity. The sobering truth is that a lot of companies buy from supply chains that employ slaves. Listen to this. Those supply chains enslave more people today around the world than any other time in history. Any other time in the history of the world. If James warns don't buy into the system, it sounds like a lot of us in some way have. And there are a lot of easy ways to kind of combat that. One website I would encourage you to at least check out. It's called fairtradecertified.org. And it's got, it's like a global movement of companies, shoppers, and organizations like putting people first. And it's got good stuff, by the way. It's not just like chinky, like it's got like chocolate and coffee. Can I get an amen? Like that's, but I think James would maybe put it this way. Don't buy into the system. Be just. The possibility of the great good that we could do with our money is amazing, but the challenge before us is to be good stewards of it. Not just with our money, by the way, with our time, talent, and treasure. If we saw everything that we have as a gift, every breath, every resource, every talent, every dollar as something on loan to us from God that we're to steward well in the world. Maybe James would put it this way, don't hoard, be wise. Don't cheat, be fair. Don't be selfish, be generous, and don't buy into the system, be just. I have a a fair amount of confidence that when James wrote this, he had in mind something that his older brother had said a little while earlier. Many of you know this passage, Matthew chapter six, Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And then he says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There it is. I would argue James, Jesus, Paul, the writer to the New Testament, it's not ultimately about your dollars, it's about your heart. Jesus is ultimately after your heart. And what he's saying is like, you know when the, uh, like when the oil light comes on your dashboard, which for me is often, <laughs> when the oil light on my dashboard of my car comes on, it's not to let me know that I have a light problem, it's to let me know that I have an oil problem. It's an indication of what's happening under the hood, beneath the scenes. Part of what Jesus is saying here is, do you wanna know where your heart really is? Look at the accounts. Do you want to know what your heart really cares about? (laughs) Follow the paper trail. It's one thing to say it or post it. It's something else entirely to live it. Where your treasure is, wherever that is, that's where your heart actually is. And the reason I think this is so profound for us to grapple with today is that generosity, I would argue, was like one of the hallmarks of the early church. Think about it. The early church didn't have stages and lights and microphones and websites. As good as all of those things are, they had radical generosity. They had a posture towards their things that was like 
unprecedented. And history shows us there are a number of people throughout history who were not Christ followers, who were not fans of Christians who wrote about this generosity. Lucian puts it this way. He says, it's incredible to see the fervor with which the people of that religion help each other in their wants. They spare nothing. That is scandalous. We see that in the book of Acts, right? They shared among them so that no one among them had a need. Because they recognized, look at, look at what God has entrusted to us. If the gift of grace is real, then how can I live with a, a white-knuckled grip? And it's even more than that. It wasn't even just for their own. Listen to what Julian says. Their success lies not in their branding or their evangelism or their strategy. Their success lies in their charity to strangers. The impious Galileans support not only their poor, but ours as well. He's saying, how do you stop that? How do you squash out a movement where just, they just care for everybody? You don't have to be in. You don't have to sign on the dotted line. They just simply see everything they have as a gift on loan to them. That's unstoppable. How do you, how do you squash out a movement that sees everything as on loan, as a gift? And we simply say, all right, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. With whatever you have, whether you think it's a little or a lot. I think maybe my, my favorite passage that speaks to this idea, though, comes from 1 Timothy. It's the Apostle Paul writing to a young apprentice named Timothy, and he says this. Suggest to those who are rich. No, what's, what does it say? Command. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Some of us know that all too well. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Second command, command them to do good. To be rich in what? In good deeds. And to be generous and willing to share in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. This is my favorite part. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. He's saying live this way so that you can actually take hold of the life that is really life, that is really living, not just because you should or some pastor told you to or because it's the right thing to do. He's saying, man, if you're not living like this, you're taking hold of a life that is less than real, true, abiding life. And it's really hard to take hold of the life that is truly life like this. With our fists clenched, and here's, here's what I found to be true in my life, at least. When we rely on wealth, something begins to happen to our hope. It migrates, doesn't it? When I put all of my hope in wealth, Paul's saying, don't, don't let that happen. Don't let your hope migrate. And here's why I think that's so significant, because we can't satisfy the eternal with the temporal. That like hunger, and you cannot satisfy what's eternal with the temporal. This is why I think James and Jesus and Paul are talking about laying up a treasure. Like Ecclesiastes says, eternity has been placed in the heart of every person. So when we're caught up in like stockpiling and looking out for number one, you probably have the thought, is this all there is? Paul is saying, absolutely not. Be generous. Assume this posture and take hold of the life that is truly life. Imagine if we actually did that. Imagine if we made this our prayer. I will not place my hope in riches, but in him who richly provides. I will not place my hope in riches, but in him who richly provides. Imagine if we did that. So maybe some questions to, to grapple with this week. Maybe ask yourself, do I truly believe that everything is God's? Like seriously, sit with that. Like wrestle with that. Maybe ask, do I believe that God is really good? Can, can he be trusted with my time, my talent, my treasure? Maybe ask, what does God want me to do with his resources? What if, what if our prayer wasn't, God, 
how much of my money do I have to give? What if, the, what if the prayer was, how much of your money do I get to keep? Because it's all yours. It's all yours. And then lastly, maybe we could ask this, what am I doing with what God has given me? Like, what if we became known as a people of like wild, extravagant generosity? People would line up around the building. Because it's just not how the world works. I think the best reflection we can ever be of God is not the minutia of our theology, but our unprecedented generosity. So wherever you find yourself in that spectrum, what if we were a people that began to simply pray, God, would you loosen my white knuckled grip on the illusion that I'm actually in control? Help me to see everything that you've given me as a gift, not for my sake, but for the sake of the world. Let's pray. God, I, I know that especially nowadays to, sp to speak about money for, for someone, so many of us can be so stressful. We can put up our guard, God, but would you, for the first time, for the hundredth time, would you show us in maybe a new and fresh way what it means to live a lifestyle of generosity because at the center of the gospel message, God, you have been so generous to us. You've been so kind to us. God, may that be reflected in every conversation, every budget, every meal, every choice. God, help us to reflect the heart of a good and generous God to a world so desperately in need of hope and healing. God, show us in a new way that it's all, it's all yours. And help us to be faithful stewards of that, God. We thank you and we love you. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at BridgeChurchTN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.